Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Title of the message, Even Those Who Pierced Him. The illustration I shared last week is still appropriate for, the, for this morning's text. God's sphere and our sphere meet and merge like a dramatic act in a theater. With lights off, the audience silenced, music soft but building, a sudden light burst onto the stage. Actors emerge from the audience, making their way to the front. The stage is set up to resemble a great room half full of people with great anticipation for what is about to happen. For Jews, the temple was the place where heaven and earth met. For you and me, Jesus is God with us. He is the person and place where heaven and earth meet. This book shows the stage as an extension of the auditorium. The music plays that sudden burst of light shows the Lord's servants emerging from the audience, making their way to the front, filled with expectancy. Do you have expectancy toward the Lord's return? Do you live day by day with a sense of anticipation? Thinking today could be the day. Do you live with anticipation that this could be the day that at least you personally see your Lord face to face and know Him even as you are fully known? Four points this morning to the churches. From the one true God, Jesus, your deliverer, and promise. Let's begin by reading chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John to the seven spirits, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. As we go to the Lord in prayer, one cannot help but see an emphasis on the triune God in this text. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, think upon that one true God who reveals himself as Father, Son, and his Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for your goodness once again. Lord, we thank you that you are not just creator, that you are not just protector, that you are not just one who makes promises, or not just the lawgiver,
You're not just that baby that was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a feeding trough. You're not just a man who was on a cross, but you are God. And you are our King who lives and reigns and will make all things new. Lord, give us wisdom as we read from your word. Give us wisdom as we read from this last book of the canon of Holy Scripture. May we take it to heart. May we not fall toward an extreme, but may we look to it and glean that which you intended for your audience in the first century while making application for Sovereign Grace Assembly in 2023. We love you. We praise you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To the churches. It is not insignificant that John wrote to the churches. Though he was writing to seven specific churches, though in context the message was for them, it is just as applicable for you and me on this day in 2023 as it was when, that, when those first congregations received the messenger on that circuit and heard it read in their presence. These were actual historical churches in the Roman province of Asia, known today as Turkey. There's no getting around that these were actual churches. Indeed, there were other churches. We read in Acts chapter 20, verses 5 through 12, of a church in Troas. We read in Colossians 1, verse 2, of the church at Colossae. We read in Colossians chapter 4, verse 13, of a church in Hierapolis. By the way, when we get to chapter 3, and we begin dealing with the church at Laodicea, these two churches that I just mentioned, the church at Colossae, and the church at Hierapolis are going to help us in interpreting the message which Jesus had for the Laodiceans. So the question is, why these seven? If we know that there were more, and if we know that within less than a hundred years of John writing to these seven churches that there were other churches in the region, why these seven? Some would speculate that these churches have a prophetic purpose, describing various church ages throughout history. While there might be application for that, you can make a strong case for Ephesus and Smyrna, and then you skip four, and then you can make a strong case for Laodicea. So it's problematic that these are simply church ages. Others recognize that the text itself does not present this view. Therefore, these are simply representative churches in every age having common patterns of obedience and disobedience. 
the churches with whom you and me have associated, affiliated, fellowshiped within the course of your life are not unlike these seven churches. Every church, every church that has ever existed or that ever will exist will have patterns of obedience and disobedience. If you ever find the perfect church, don't go there. Because you will mess it up. By the way, you won't find the perfect church. Because churches are made up of imperfect people who live in an imperfect world, but serve the perfect God. <clears throat> Regardless of where you land on the application of the messages to these congregations, you cannot get past the fact that these churches were prominent and they were strategic. These churches were prominent and strategic. That first church that John is going to address, Ephesus, was only about 40 or 50 miles from Patmos. So it would have been the very first one that the messenger arrived at in that circuit and delivered these 22 chapters. In the first century, the Asiarchs leading council met yearly in succession of seven cities. So there was a governmental body in that first century that would meet yearly in seven cities. John, in this revelation, addressed six of those cities only replacing the city of, and I'm going to butcher this, Sisychus. Thankfully, with the more centrally located and easier to pronounce, Thyatira. So the fact that we have these seven specific cities that John addresses that are almost identical to the circuit in which a governmental body met is not incidental. These cities were known in the first century. Ephesus both enjoyed greater prominence, and like I've already said, they were the first stop. All seven were strategically located to reach various populations. All seven were strategically located to reach various populations. Because John is one man. The messenger he sends is one man. What we know about man is man can only be in one place at one time. But if that messenger goes to Ephesus and then goes on from there to Smyrna, Folks from Ephesus can go to the surrounding areas, sharing the message that they've received from John, sharing this message of hope in the midst of conflict and distress. John gives the common greeting, Chorus and Irene, or in the Hebrew, Shalom, grace and peace. These are not unique to New Testament writers, but the New Testament writers and John packaged much into that common greeting that we don't find in secular letters of the day. Grace and peace. Grace is that unmerited favor that you and me receive from the one true God. 
found in Jesus, his son. Shalom. Shalom is a holistic peace. We see shalom in the description of John. He grew in favor with God and with man. So we know who's addressed. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And we know the sender from the one true God. From him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, John introduced the source of blessing with a clear triadic formula. Which was, which is, which is to come. Make no mistake about it. He is stating something very specific about God. That God is eternal. God lives outside of time. He was at a time when you were not. He is... And he will be in a time when you are not. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 2 through 4. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 2. Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, and his driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he laid, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last am he. Isaiah says that he is the first and the last. Just as John said, which was and is and is to come. From him which is and which was and which is to come is a reference to the Father. The Father sent the Son. From him which was, which is, which was, which is to come is the Father. Now, some have speculated that the seven spirits are angels, but that's problematic because nowhere else in the book of the Revelation are angels referred to like that. And not only that, but with that triadic formula, it's highly doubtful that John would refer to angels and take away from the triad God. From the seven spirits which are before the throne, is the Holy Ghost. Turn with me to Zechariah. Zechariah, and I promise I will give you time to turn there. What? Zechariah chapter 4. One of my former professors posted on Facebook recently the moment that the preacher says, 
Turn with me in your Bibles to Zechariah, and then he immediately starts reading. Zechariah chapter 4, and we will read verses 2 and verse 6. I think after Revelation, we'll go back to the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 2. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold a candlestick of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not my not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So just as John says from the seven spirits which are before the throne, Zechariah says that the candlestick was of gold, his, lamp, his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes of the seven lamps, or upon the top thereof. And then verse 6, he says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. By the way, even in the Old Testament, we see evidence for the Trinity. Zechariah says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit. We see, that, we see a triadic formula. Indeed, if, if in your reading of the Bible, you will take note of how many times God uses threes to disclose himself, to reveal himself. And then from Jesus Christ. From Jesus Christ. Turn over to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And we'll pick up reading uh, halfway in, into verse 6. Revelation chapter 4. In the second part of verse 6. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts, full of eyes, before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast like a calf. And the third beast had a face as of a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Not once, but twice, there in verse 8. We see that triadic formula once again. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. From Him which was, which is, which was, and which is to come is the Father. From the seven spirits which are before His throne is the Holy Ghost. And from Jesus Christ, who is, as we know, the Son. Then clearly proclaiming Jesus as deity and equal with God, he presents the identity and function of the Christ. And I want you to notice that as John presents the function, as he presents the identity of Christ, he does so maintaining that triadic formula. He refers to Jesus first 
as the faithful witness. The faithful witness. That's referring to Jesus' earthly life of obedience. Turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 7. John chapter 7 verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Jesus lived an earthly life of obedience, and thus he is the faithful witness. John chapter 18, verse 37. John chapter 18, verse 37. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. And then 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate, witnessed a good confession. Jesus is that faithful witness who lived an earthly life of obedience. But not only is he the faithful witness, he's the first begotten of the dead. He is the first begotten of the dead. That refers to his resurrection. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Paul says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 18. Colossians 1, 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Jesus is the faithful witness who lived obediently. He is the first begotten of the dead. He was resurrected. And he is the prince of the kings of the earth. That that references that all things are in him. All things are in him. For he is the prince of the kings of the earth. Psalm 89. Psalm 89. Psalm 89, and we'll read verses 19 through 29. Psalm 89, verse 19. 
Then thou spakest in vision to thy holy one, and saidest, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his name be exalted, shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Jesus is the prince of the kings of the earth. He is the one about whom David was promised that David would never cease to have a man sit on his throne. All things are in Jesus. He was obedient in life. He resurrected from the dead. And all things are in him. Now the question, though, in that third one, the prince of the kings of the earth, what did John mean? Was he referring to the emperor? When he says of Jesus that Jesus is the prince of the kings of the earth, did John mean the emperor? Was he referring to to Nero. Did he mean defeated foes of believers? Satan, the dragon, sin, and death. Did he mean believers? You and me as kings of the earth. We could spend hours and days and weeks deciding, debating which of those three it is. Because honestly, there could be a case made that Jesus is the prince over the kings of the earth, Nero. Because Nero was the man who ruled the earth at that time. We could build a case biblically that he is the prince of the kings of the earth, referring to those defeated foes of Satan, the dragon, sin and death. There are scripture verses to support that. But in the context, in the context of what takes place next, what is written next, I believe it is most fitting for us to interpret John as referring to believers, as to you and me as kings of the earth. Our third point as we wrap up verse 5 and move into verse 6, Jesus, your deliverer. Jesus, your deliverer. Revelation, once again, verse 5. Picking up with, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests, and to God and His Father, to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Once again, John uses a triadic formula. This entire section, verses 4 through 8, is chocked full of threes. Whether you're referring to which was, which is, which is to come. Whether you're referring to the faithful witness, the firstborn begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, or now him who loved us and washed us and made us. John is getting his message across. 
He serves the one true and living God. He worships the triune God. That triune God loved you. That triune God loved you. He is not simply a transcendent God sitting up there in heaven looking down as a spectator. He is not merely that transcendent God of the deist who, like a watchmaker, created the heavens and the earth, wound everything up, and then stepped back going on vacation and let everything wind down. No, he is more than just transcendent. He is imminent. He is personally involved in his creation. He is personally involved in your life and mine. He loved you. Not only did he love you, but he washed you. We learned in the book of Romans that in Adam, all sinned. Death came by one man. For none is good. No, not one. You and me are sinners. We are depraved from conception. But he washed you. He loved you. He washed you. And look at that last one. There in verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So when you take verse 5 and verse 6 together, you see in verse 5 that he is the prince of the kings of the earth. You see in verse 6, and hath made us, he made you, sovereign grace, kings and priests unto God and his Father. I believe it's clear from the context that John meant believers. He meant specifically the members of those seven churches to whom he wrote. And by application, he means every member of every church throughout history. You and me are kings of the earth. But we are not sovereign. We submit to the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. You experience Christ's continual care. Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 through 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He says, Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Rejoice, why? Because your victory is not in you. As Zechariah said, your victory is not by might, your victory is not by power, but by His Spirit, saith the Lord. Your victory is in the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. 
Your testimony is not what you did, but that which Christ did for you and in you and continues to do through you. And that gives you great comfort. Great continual comfort. Do you experience that comfort when the trials and pains of life come upon you? That the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony beckon you to rejoice. Alan F. Johnson says the Christian community is the continuation of the Old Testament people of God, redeemed by Christ's blood and made heirs of his king of his future kingly rule on the earth. You and me are the very continuation of that which God started with Adam, continued in Noah, promised to Abraham, raised up in Isaac and Jacob and the patriarchs. You and me are the continuation of the covenant of the nation that God brought together under Moses. You and me are the continuation of the kingdom that God gave to David. You and me are not some oddball that just happened in time. You and me are not round pegs trying to fit into a square hole. You and me are, are not just some anomaly that happens in time and space, but you and me are the very continuation of the Old Testament people of God. Far too many folks who attend churches today, especially in Baptist churches, think that Baptist church history began in their lifetime. Far too many folks who call themselves Christians think that church history started in their lifetime or in the lifetime of their parents and grandparents. Church history, though we trace it from the time of Pentecost, church history goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Because God was calling out a people for himself. God created a man for himself. God created a woman for himself. When they fell into sin, even in their sons, Cain and Abel, God called a people out for himself. And after Abel's death, God raised up a people in Seth. You and me are the continuation of what God started in Adam and Abel and Seth. Live into that heritage. Your history is not just in your lifetime or your grandparents' lifetime or in the history of our nation or in the history of Western civilization. Your history is rooted in Genesis. Finally, verses 7 and 8, we see the promise. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's a dramatic cry. Look! 
He is coming with clouds. Throughout Scripture, coming with clouds is indicative. It's a sign of judgment that's coming. And Jesus promises to John that he's coming with clouds. There is a tension between your actual present circumstances and your royal priestly status. Job experienced it, especially as he's scraping off the boils from his body. The children of Israel experienced it. They were freed from slavery in Egypt, but now they're in the wilderness. They're enduring the circumstances of the desert. You and me experience that tension every single day of life. That tension between what we experience right here, right now, and our royal status in Christ. Which side of that tension is winning in your life right now? Are your present circumstances winning? Or is your royal status in Christ winning? I pray that your royal status in Christ is winning. But until the day that you breathe your last, there will be that tension. It's always been and it will be until Jesus comes again. The Lord's promises are now and not yet. I saw a great illustration. Imagine three pictures. Each of them have a, are filled a third of the way with water. Three pitchers, and you can see that each of them only have a third of water in them. When you and me think about the revelation, when you and me think about end times, when you and me think about the promise of Jesus' return, folks will either overemphasize the first pitcher or they'll overemphasize the third pitcher. Either they will take all of water one and two and pour it, or I said one and two, two and three, and pour it into one, or they'll take all of one and two and pour it into three. John, you and Charlotte for 12 years experienced preaching about the end times, about Revelation, in which everything was future. Everything was, was way off there in the future. Of which everything, of which revelation was interpreted through that which we see in C CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, through the, through the local paper. That's the futurist viewpoint. The other side of that is the hyper preterist viewpoint where everything is focused on the past. Jesus promised, and Jesus delivers both now and not yet. There are some things in Revelation that are clearly future. There are some things in Revelation that are clearly past. And there are some things in Revelation that are in that second picture, of which nobody overemphasizes. Let's keep our pitchers evenly filled with water. Put another way, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Warning. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Even those who pierced him. Pilate, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin were all the players involved at the crucifixion. All the players who were 
bent on indicting Jesus, in sentencing Jesus. In a very real way, they were representatives of all mankind. For have you and I not heard that it was your sin and mine that put him on the cross? So in a very real way, they were representatives of mankind. They were personally, actually, historically responsible, but also they were representative of you and me. Many who cried, crucify him, were still alive when this was written. His promise here, combined with that which you read and heard last week, we, read, we heard in chapter 1, verse 1, things which must soon take place. Chapter 1, verse 3, for the time is near, say much about when this book was written and what John prophesied. When we hear things which must soon take place, when we hear, for the time is near, and when we hear, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Yeah, in a spiritual sense, all of us pierced him. But look at John's choice of words, even those who pierced him. John's not speaking generically. John's not painting with a broad brushstroke because all of our sin put him on the cross. John says very specifically, even those who pierced him. This book was written at a time in which perhaps Pilate or Annas or Caiaphas or some members of that Sanhedrin were still alive. It was written at a time in which many in the crowd of Jerusalem who cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, were still alive. When John writes this, he is indicting the very ones who indicted Jesus. We'll close with these words from Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 28. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even to the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Is God all in all in your life? Those who actually historically pierced him saw the day that John was describing. But every single one of us were responsible for piercing him. And we will see the day when he comes again in clouds. Do you trust him until then? Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, we pray that you would shape our hearts by your word. Lord, we pray that you would motivate us to serve you, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified wherever we may go. It's in your name we pray. Amen.